buying power, a history of consumer activism in America. Buying power uh, comes from a term that was used by a, one of the groups I look at called the League of Women Shoppers. Their slogan was, use your buying power for justice. And the idea behind that slogan was that Americans consume a lot of goods um, and that consumption is a powerful way of making a moral statement. And in my book, I try to extend that idea from the League of Women Shoppers who existed in the 1930s and 40s throughout all of American history to argue that Americans have consistently used their buying power for political and moral and ethical purposes. Contemporary commentators often describe consumption as an apolitical act, as an act that sort of separates us from other people, um, and that is often considered as private and individual. But I think history shows that Americans have had another side in how they viewed consumption, which is viewing consumption as connecting us with other people, connecting us to the people who made the goods that we buy, um, connecting us to other people who maybe buy or don't buy through boycotting similar goods. And in my book, I tried to show that um, Americans, I think, have been deeply concerned about the moral impact of their shopping. The tradition of consumer activism is as old as the American nation, indeed a little bit older. Um, I trace it back to the run-up to the American Revolution in the 1760s when the non-importation movement began, as it was called. And this was a movement led by colonists, uh, particularly to get merchants not to import goods from Great Britain. And uh, one of the ways in which Americans first defined themselves as a nation rather than as British colonial subjects was in that process of boycotting British goods and beginning to try to buy goods that were domestically produced. Uh, this was a really radically new kind of political movement and was one of the things that led to the formation of the American nation. Probably the most important and famous event in this process was the Boston Tea Party, where British tea was dumped overboard by American colonists who were trying to get other colonists not to buy British goods. This was seen as a way of weakening uh, British colonial power, but also as establishing a new kind of national identity. One of the things that I find is that a, a lot of American historians know about the American Revolution and the non-importation movement, but oftentimes when they think about consumer activism, uh, they next turn to things like the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s. And so it's a very discontinuous history. And what I tried to show is that Americans have turned to consumer politics consistently uh, from the American Revolution through the entire 19th century, through the 20th century, to the present. And one of the movements that I look at um, is the movement by abolitionists to boycott slave-made goods. This began in the 1820s and was um, a movement uh, called the Free Produce Movement. And the idea was that um, people who opposed slavery needed to um, not buy goods that were made by slaves. And the argument made by uh, these free produce abolitionists was that purchasing slave-made goods was tantamount to hiring a slave yourself. Um, so what they tried to do was say, there's really no moral difference between being a slave owner and a consumer of slave-made goods. Essentially, you're supporting the slave owner and you're supporting the system of slavery. And so um, um, this was a movement that was never particularly large, but had a big social impact. And uh, the other thing that this group did was they set up stores in which they sold what they called free produce, that is goods that were made by non-slave labor, by free labor. And their idea was that as more and more Americans bought goods from free produce stores, slave owners would have an incentive to switch over from hiring uh, and purchasing human beings as slaves to purchasing free wage laborers um, for, their, for their employment. Uh, the movement never succeeded. The free produce stores were not economically successful. But I argue in my book that they set an important precedent of not only the boycott, which had gone back to the American Revolution, but also what today we call the boycott, which is to kind of try to not only punish those who are, who are doing things you don't like, but to reward those who are doing things that you do like. And the free produce stores were among the first in human history that I've discovered that did that. For a lot of consumer activists, there was no difference between buying power and political power. Buying power, they argued, was a kind of political power, not the only kind of political power. But they argued that um, in a society that was no longer a subsistence society, in other words, 
Americans were not making goods for themselves. We were a market-based society from the very early 19th century. Therefore, when you purchased goods, you were establishing relations. Uh, these were invisible because you didn't see the farmer who grew the wheat that you bought to make the bread that you bought, uh, or the butter that you used, or the clothing that you wore, or eventually the technology that more and more Americans were buying. But even though you didn't see them, you had a very real and direct connection to them. And indeed, you were morally responsible for the conditions in which they worked. And, um, and this idea was um, repeated again and again through the 19th into the 20th century. And the idea here was that if you define politics broadly as how we treat one another, how we, um, uh, um, the kind of ethical systems that are important to us, then buying power was a form of political power. Now in the 20th century, consumer activists began to talk more explicitly about the role of the government in protecting um, consumer rights, in promoting um, uh, the interests of consumers as a group in society. But even before that, um, consumer activism uh, was deeply political, I argue. And in fact, in my book, I call consumer activism an American political tradition. Largely unknown, but I think if you look, you see that there's, this is one of the most consistent threads of our political activity. Boycotts really have two fundamental ideas. One is economic, uh, and the other is political, and these are often related. So uh, one aspect of a boycott is to economically harm those who are doing what the boycotters see as something wrong or immoral. So in the example of uh, the abolitionist boycotts, their goal was to economically harm slave owners, but I would say it wasn't really to harm the economy as a whole because the abolitionists believed really in these free market ideas. They believed that if you give people incentives, to do other things that they will do it. So if you give slave owners an incentive to um, hire other kinds of labor, to hire free labor, they'll do it. If you give consumers an incentive to buy free labor goods, they will do it. And therefore, this won't harm the economy. In fact, they argued this would be a good thing for the economy because you'd have more uh, wage earners in the economy, you'd have more money in the economy. Those people could in turn buy more goods. Um, and so forth. So in general, the idea of boycotters has been to harm a particular segment of the economy on a temporary basis, but, but that would ultimately in the long run be good for the economy of the whole. And even in most cases, their goal usually wasn't to drive a business out, out into, into bankruptcy. It was to get that business to change its practices in some way. And so they often tried to do that. Now you do see extreme examples of boycotts where there's a lot of personal animus and they do want to harm a particular business man or corporation. But by and large, the attitude of boycotters has been if this person changes what they do, we'll be happy to spend our money there. There's nothing personal in this. This is more, again, a matter of ethics and morals. Um, but oftentimes the other side of boycotts is to raise consciousness about an issue. So many other uh, boycotts, the goal has been partly to have this economic impact, but oftentimes to let Americans know um, that they have a connection to a moral issue. So an example of that might be the United Farm Workers Great Boycott, which was very popular uh, beginning in the late 1960s through the 70s for many decades thereafter. Um, in 1971, there was an article in the New York Times that estimated that more than 17 million Americans uh, were acting in solidarity with this boycott. And I think the idea of that boycott was not so much to harm the grape and lettuce growers in California, but to really raise awareness about the problems that migrant laborers were facing, the very, very bad work conditions, the dangerous conditions, the unhealthy conditions, and to get Americans to be concerned about something that most people, when you go into a grocery store, your grapes or your lettuce looks beautiful, you don't necessarily think about the connections between you and the person who grew those um, and the pesticides that might be harming them and their children. And the whole idea of that boycott was to really get Americans to think about that. And I think that was an example of a boycott that succeeded more at the political level than the economic level. One of the things that the internet has done has made it much easier for people to get together um, across big distances and organize boycotts, boycotts, and other forms of consumer movements. So um, if you look online, you can discover hundreds of boycotts that are going on as we speak.
And about every year or two, there's a boycott that kind of captures the American, American ma imagination, um, sometimes for a brief period, other times for a longer period. And um, it is a way that I think Americans continue to express their political views. What do, uh, was the Occupy movement 